everybody, it's your girl Lunatic Froggy. Today we are going to be discussing some UK women serial killers. First, we're going to be talking about the first serial killer ever caught. Woman serial killer ever caught in the UK. Her name is Marianne Cotton. Now, Miss Marianne Cotton over here was born on All Hallows Eve. Now, what you need to know about her childhood is she was born to Margaret and Michael. They ended up having a daughter named Margaret in 1834 that passed away shortly after being born, and a son named Robert, who was born in 1835. Okay, this all happens in the 1800s. Marianne, at the age of eight, moved with her family to the village of Murren. Um, She was very regular to Sunday school, known to be prim and proper, at Sunday school, known to have, um, she was just not highly intelligent, but basic intelligence, but she was always at, she was known to be punctual. At the age of 16, she ended up moving away from her mom and stepdad because her father passed away when she was eight years old. Um, he ended up falling down a mine shaft. So, that's gruesome. But, she ended up moving away from her mother and stepfather's house to become a nurse in the village of Salt, South Hatton. Um, they ended up, like, re- her mother, Margaret, and her stepbrother, George, ended up sending all of the children to the boarding school of Darlington over the next three years. And then she, uh, Marianne, returned home to be a dressmaker. So she went to school for nursing, but then ended up being trained to be a dressmaker. Now... At the ripe age of 20 in 1852, Marianne fell in love with a man named William. Now, before I get any further, it was not a law that you had to register your children, birth, or death at the time. It was not a law until 1874 that you had to register them. So she ended up having like four or five children who died at a very young age with William. Before her first daughter, who was registered, and her name was Margaret Jane, and she was born in 1856. Now, this is important because it falls in the timeline with all these deaths and you need to know the date and time or the date and their names or otherwise the shit will get confusing because there's a lot of margarets and yeah so william and marianne ended up moving to northeast england where william worked as a fireman abroad a steam vessel and then he ended up being a foreman and they had another daughter named Isabella in 1858 well their first daughter Margaret Jane ended up dying in 1860 at the age of four shortly after their daughter they had a daughter again named Margaret Jane so there's it went Margaret Jane, eighteen fifty six. Um, Isabella, 
who was born at 1858. Margaret Jane passed away at eight in 1860. And then this other Margaret Jane, this other Margaret Jane daughter was born in 1861. And then in 1863, they had a son named John William, but he ended up passing away in 1864 of gastric fever. A year after their son, John William, passed away, William died of an uh, intestinal disorder in 1865. Now, all of these deaths were, there was a life insurance policy on all of them. So she ended up getting $35 for the passing of her husband. And then she ended up getting like two pounds for John William. So after her husband passed away, she ended up moving to Seaham Harbor where she struck up a relationship with Joseph Natters. During this time, her three and a half year old daughter, the second Margaret Jane, died of Tysus fever, leaving her with only one child up out of nine that were born. So she had one and eight passed away. She returned to the Sunderlands and took up employment at the Sunderland Infirmary, House of Recovery for the Cure of Contagious Fever. And she sent her only surviving child, Isabella, to live with her mother. Probably the smartest thing she could have done. Um, one of her patients in the infirmary was an engineer named George Ward. They married at St. Peter's Church on August 28th of 1865. Ward continued to suffer from the previous illness. And when, shortly after they, they married, like within like a year, yeah, it'd be a year, they he passed away um on october 20th of 1866 after a long illness characterized by paralysis and intestinal problems the cause of death recorded on his death certificate was the english chlora and typhoid typhoid the attending doctors that were caring for him before he ended up getting married said they were um, surprised that he died so suddenly because he really shunned up. But again, Marianne collected insurance money from her second husband. Now, shortly after her second husband passed away, she ended up becoming a housekeeper for a man named James Robbins, whose wife, Hannah, had recently passed away. That's why he hired Marianne as a housekeeper in November. A month later, uh, when James's baby, John, died of gastric fever, he turned to the housekeeper and he ended up getting her pregnant. He ended up getting Marianne pregnant. Then Marianne's mother, who was living in Seaham Harbor, became ill with hepatitis. Marianne immediately dropped everything and ran to her mother's aid. Now, here's the funny part. Her mother was beginning to recover from hepatitis and ended up getting complaining of stomach pain. She started getting stomach pains. And soon after she 
died. Nine days after Marianne's arrival. So in 1867, Marianne's stepfather, George Stott, married his widow, the neighbor, Hannah Polly. Paley? So Marianne ended up bringing her daughter back to the Roberts, James Robinson's household and soon developed, who she severe, soon developed severe stomach pains and died. So again, Isabella moves home and she dies within like a couple of months. As so as did two of James's children. They all passed away and were buried in the in last week of April and the first week of May. So like literally a week span. Mary Ann ended up receiving a life insurance par- policy on Isabella. So literally at this point in time she has no children. But James married Marianne, and their first child, Margaret Isabella, was born. But on the baptismal records, it's Mary Isabella, not Margaret Isabella. And she became ill and died in February of 1868. So literally... It was less than four months old. Their second child, George, was born in 1869. But Mr. James, he became very suspicious of his wife's insistence that he has a life insurance and policy. He discovered that she had run up debt of 60 pounds behind his back and had stolen more than 50 pounds that she was supposed to be putting into the bank. Then he found out that Marianne had been forcing his older children to pawn household valuables. He threw her out and he got custody of their son, George. Thank goodness. So, he ended up divorcing, divorcing Mary Ann and keeping their son George. So George will be one of the children that can, have made it. So shortly after leaving the James residence, she ended up finding herself living on the streets. Until her friend Margaret Cotton introduced her to her brother Frederick Cotton, a pit man and recent widower living in Waldbolt, who had lost two of his four children. Margaret had acted as a substitute mother for the remaining children, Frederick Jr. and Charles, but in late March, of 1870 she ended up dying in an undetermined stomach ailment leaving Marianne to console the grieving Frederick Sr. who then became so the friend Margaret Cotton introduced her to Frederick Martin ended up dying of undetermined stomach illnesses, leaving Frederick to console Miss or Marianne to console Frederick, who then ended up getting pregnant because apparently the way Marianne consoled grieving husbands was to sleep with them. So she's on her 12th pregnancy. Yes, you heard that right. Soon, Marianne and Mr. C- 
Cotton here, Frederick Cotton, got married. Because, of course, you gotta marry the one that's pregnant with your children. Should have ran. Um, and their son, shortly after, their son, Robert, was born in early 1871. Soon after, Marianne learned that the former lover, Joseph Natris, was living 48 kilometers, 30 miles, away from where they're staying. So she ended up packing up the whole entire family and moving over to where her former lover was. Now, Mr. Cotton himself, Mr. Frederick Cotton, ended up passing away in December of 1871 to gastric fever and you know damn well insurance had been effective on his life and those of his sons so after Frederick, Frederick's death Natris who we'll call Joseph ended up Becoming Marianne's lodger, she gained employment as a nurse to an excess officer recovering from smallpox. Popu it was uh, normal back then to get smallpox. A lot of people called him John Quick Manning, but... There is no record of John Quick Manning. There, however, is a record of Richard Quick Manning. So, that's important to know. He had been found in the records. He may be the real name of Mary Cotton's lover. Soon, Mary Cotton became pregnant with her 13th child. Mommy needs to keep her fucking legs shut. That's what she needs. So Frederick Jr. died in 1872 and the infant Robin Robert soon after passed away. Then Natris became ill with the gastric fever and died just after revising his will in Marianne's favor. The insurance policy Marianne had taken out on the still living Charles's life after words it was still awaited collecting. So literally Homie has gone through three husbands so far. Oh my bad. Four husbands so far. And 13 children of her own and three children from previous relationships. No, four children of previous relationships. So she ended up starting to date Charles Edward Cotton. And this is where her downfall comes in. Because Thomas Riley asked her to help a nurse, or help to nurse a woman who was ill with smallpox. She complained that the last surviving cotton boy, Charles Edward, was in the way and asked Riley if he could be committed to the workhouse. Riley, who also served as the assistant coroner said she needed to accompany him. She told Riley that the boy was sickly and added I won't be troubled long. He'll go like all the rest of the cottons. Five days later, Marianne told Riley, who was the coroner, that the boy had died. Riley went to the village police and pursued the doctors to do 
a um autopsy but they called it an investigation and they were going to hold off on paying the um insurance money so instead of going to the doctor's office after the baby passed charles passed away she went to the insurance office then she discovered that no money will be paid out until the death certificate was issued an inquest was held and the uh they determined that it was natural causes um mary ann claimed that she used a root to relieve his illness and said riley had made accusations against her because she had rejected his advances so then comes in the local newspaper and uh word got around that marianne had moved around northern england and lost three husbands a lover a friend her mother and 11 children all of whom died of stomach fevers coincidence i think not so the dr william kilburn who had attended charles's death kept samples of like his blood and they all showed um that they contained arsenic so of course he went to the police and they ended up arresting her um Cotton's trial began on March 5th. Um, so they had a problem in the selection of prosecution counsel. Um, which caused a whole bunch of issues the defense of the case was handled by thomas and the doctor testified that there were was no other powder so like they went in and they like went through all of her stuff and they found arsenic powder on a shelf and the doctor said there was no other powder on the same shelf in the chemist shop as the arsenic only liquid the chemist himself claimed that there were other there was other powders so like there's miscommunications um the anyways the jury went in 90 minutes later she was found guilty uh but she was only found guilty of charles's death she wasn't found guilty of all these other deaths but on march 20th after the convicted the wretched woman exhibited strong emotions but this gave place in a few hours after her uh habit of cold reserved demeanor and while she harbors the strong conviction that the royal clemency will be extended towards her and she will stultly assort her innocence of the crime that she had been convicted of so basically she's trying to say she's innocent even though we all know that she killed every single one of the people she loved in her life um mary ann cotton was hung on the 24th of march so four days after her trial ended and she was convicted she was hung but she did not die because of her neck breaking she died of strangulation because the rope was rigged too short and people are saying that that was deliberate so of mary ann's 13 children only two survived um that would be margaret edith 
and her son George from her relationship with James Robinson. So literally only two of 13 children survived. And the only husband that survived was George. So let me know what you think about that one and we will move on to the next one. So ladies and gentlemen, this is the son of something. Beverly Gale Elite, who was born October 4th, 1986. Now there ain't much we know about that I know about Beverly Gale. Uh, she grew up in the village of Corby Glen near the town of Grathen. She has two sisters and a brother. Her father's name was Richard, who worked in an office license, and her mother, as a school cleaner, she attended uh, Charles Reed Secondary Morden School. Um, she ended up failing uh, entry exam for school uh, for girls, so that didn't work great. She often volunteered for babysitting jobs. She left school at the age of 16 and took a course for nursing. I swear most of the uh, serial on the libraries who um, have Munchausen's by proxy took nursing. Um, so. <sighs> on what I found there ain't a lot of information about her crimes but she ended up attacking 13 children and four of those attacks were fatal. She did this over a 59 day period. It was only following the death of Becky Phillips, the medical staff became suspicious that the number of cardiac arrests on the children's ward and the police were called in. It was found that Miss Beverly was the only nurse on duty for all of the attacks of the children and had the access to the drugs that were used. Um, four of Beverly's victims had died. She was charged with four counts of a more of unaliving, eleven counts of attempted of unaliving, and eleven counts of causing grievous bodily harm. She entered a plea of not guilty to all of the charges on May twenty eighth, nineteen ninety three. She was found guilty on each charge and sentenced to 13 concurrent terms of life imprisonment which she is still serving um in a 2018 documentary she told reportedly told close friends that before her, uh, before her trial, that she would never go to prison. After one week in prison, she refused to eat, eat and drink, and re was removed to a hospital. Um, they uh, two experts, Jeremy Coyd and. Elizabeth Yardley examined her mental state when she was arrested and concluded she was not mentally ill and she should be in prison, not a hospital. Uh, Beverly reported 
admittedly to conclude she was not or to she admitted to all 13 of her crimes in a failed application to remain at the hospital to avoid prison none of the families were ever told of her full confession on december 6 2007 mr justice stanley burton sitting at the high court justice london ordered beverly to serve the original minimum sentence of 13 or of 30 years it was reported that some families of the victims were not very happy of it uh so the minimum of her trial expired in 2021 and she was eligible for parole that doesn't mean she would get parole and let's pray she didn't get parole i will have to look that up but i think she's still sitting in prison um so while she's in prison they tried to say that she was uh diagnosed with munchausen's by proxy so one of the things that is said that um happened while she was in jail was her father passed away in 2000 two i think 2022 and he left everything for his family except ten thousand dollars which he put in a trust fund for his killer daughter he left ten thousand dollars to her it is unclear whether or not she's able to receive the money or not but she does have a ten thousand dollar trust fund in her name she according to everything that i have seen she is still sitting in prison or she's still sitting in a mental institute hospital not a prison thank goodness but she's still locked away from small children because all of the victims were children uh i did end up finding the names of the children i will not disclose that information because i really hate disclosing the information of children but yeah she is a very sick individual but she was caught and she was um sentenced right away so we're gonna move on to lacy labetti and i'm sorry it's lucy labetti now she was born on january 4th of 1990 and if you notice i'm doing these in numerical order of youngest or oldest murders to youngest um she is the british former neonatal nurse who unallied seven infants and attempted to unalive seven others between the time of june 2015 and june 2016 so within a year span she tried to do this now let's get a little bit of inf- insight on lucy labette um if we go into her younger years years she was the only child of a finance manager and an accounting clerk she was educated at um alice stone school and hereford sixth form college 
A friend who knew her since secondary school told BBC she'd been a difficult birth herself. She was very grateful for being alive to the nurse who would have helped save her life. This, the former friend states, had led her to want to become a nurse all of her life. She ended up pursuing a nursing degree at the University of Chester, where she also worked as a student nurse during her three years of training, carrying out a placement at Liverpool's Women's Hospital and the countless of Chester's Hospital. La Betty, aka Lucy, was the first member of her family to study at a university and graduate with a bachelor's of science in nursing. So she's all homie always wanted always wanted to be a nurse, but somewhere in her brain she ended up doing horrific things. So she began working as a registered nurse at the NATO neonatal unit of the counties of chester hospital in 2012 in 2013 a staff profile she said that she was responsible for caring for a wide range of babies requiring various levels of support now, if you don't know what a neonatal is, that's like for babies that were born sick. So they could go from like, eh, I mean, trouble breathing, blue babies, all the way to um, babies that were pr way premature and had to be in a needle natal with all the tubes and oxygen and all of that stuff. So Lebet so she ended up working there. She thrived on seeing the progress and supporting their families. She also took part in campaigns to raise funds for new natal unit at the hospital. Labetti told others that she found non-intensive care work boring. Labetti had two training placements at Liverpool Women's Hospital in late 2012 and early 2015, which came under investigation after her conviction in 2015. Teen, Le Lucy qualified to work with infants in intensive care. So after her, all of her training, she ended up be, um, being able to work with intensive care babies. Um, in 2016, she was resigned by the ward manager or reassigned by the ward manager from night shifts to day shifts. In 2016, Stephanie Burr led neonatologist asked management to remove Libet Lucy from clinical duties pending an investigation into her conduct. But Betty was transferred to patient who really wasn't there um, in 2016 and later to the risk and potential safety office working there until her arrest in 2018. So let's get into the invest investigations, the initial investigation. In 2015, four collapses occurred in the same Neoatology unit of the hospital, three leading to infants' deaths. 
The unit typically saw only two or three deaths a year, and the infants involved had failed to respond normally to recirculation attempts. The unit manager and Stephanie, okay, so Powell, the unit manager, and Stephanie Brewery conducted an informal interview and reported the instance to the committee of NHS Foundation Trust responsible for addressing serious incidents like these. Upon review, the committee classed the deaths as medication errors. Um, they observed that Lucy had been on shift for all of these incidents, but considered it an unsurprising co coincidence. There was only one other qualified junior nurse in the unit. And Lucy often worked extra shifts to cover for staff shortage. He stated nobody had the concerns about her practice. In 2023, reporters from The Guardian and The Times stated he was suspicious of Lucy beginning in 2015 and accused the hospital of negligence for ignoring his concerns, which fucking right. During a hospital visit on February 2016, the Care Quality Commissioner was informed of difficulties in raising concerns with managers, but heard no mention of an evaluated mortality rate. The QCQ's report in, in identified issues of short staffing and scale mix issues within the unit. So basically this whole entire time, literally the hospital is failing these patients by not taking any of the things that were addressed at the time into consideration. It had been brought up to their, you know, brought up to the doctors so many times like hey this ain't right the mortality rate had risen above what might be considered normal rates so in one year from june 2015 to june 2016 the death in the hospital just a hospital just that one unit in the hospital increased within that year um, Stephanie phoned the deputy ex uh, executive on June 24, 2016, following the 6th and 7th unexplained death shortly, shortly after Lucy returned from a holiday in Ibiza. I don't know whether that is. Ibiza? I don't know. Anyways, homie was on holiday, and soon after, boom, two more deaths, which is not normal. So, demanding that she be removed from the unit, the duty ex executive insisted that Lucy was safe to work. Like, how many fucking deaths had to happen for this shit to happen? Oh, I'm sorry, seventh, right? The trust executive, the trust executives, directors convene, convene to address the question whether to involve the police, determining Lucy's involvement to be circumstantial. So basically, they're like, "Yeah, we don't need the police. It's just circumstantial evidence." Bitch, shut the fuck up. So, after they ended up con convincing Stephanie that Lucy had nothing to do with it, they decided that um, they, they were no longer going to take uh, premature births before 32 weeks 
which really cut back on Lucy's work, I guess. Thank goodness. Um, the RCPHCH review, or RCPCH, sorry, review was initiated on September 2016 with a narrow scope that excluded ev investigating Lucy's actions or the deaths of these infants, but focused on the unit's work altogether. So again, freaking Lucy is just flying by the seat of her pants because literally they're like, yeah, no, she didn't do it. It's not her. It's literally, you know, freaking all of your work performance, your overwork, da 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 blaming everybody else except for the one person that actually did it. In September of 2016, Lucy raised a formal grievance about her late June 2016 transfer from clinical duties to hospital risk and potential safety office. So basically, she was transferred and she didn't like it. Um... The grievance was upheld by the board in 2017, which determined her removal had been orchestrated by the constituations with no hard evidence. So basically, they're like, oh, yeah, there's no evidence here. So we're just because they were never really looking for the evidence. And that's how she ended up getting fucking away with it for so long. So, Lucy... <sighs> Basically, they wanted to... They said that it was to protect Lucy from these allegations. Even though we all know that it's not true but the chief executive executive sorry had met lucy and her parents on the 22nd of december in 2016 to apologize on the behalf of the trust and assured them that the doctors who made these allegations would be dealt with he later ordered the consultants to send a letter of apologize apology to lucy basically they're like mm, we don't see you doing any of this but we're gonna make your colleagues apologize to you like what the fuck homie go fuck off in march of 2017 four consultants including stephen burry and robbie robbie jr arum Asked management to be to involve the police after receiving evidence for further investigation from the regional neonatal league. So they're still like, no, the shit's not right. Let's fucking do something about it. But instead, they let Lucy. Uh, return to work on um on May third, two thousand seventeen. So they let a killer back in there too. <sighs> they said that uh infant collapses are nearly always explainable. In May of 2024, staff writer Rachel Aviv for the infant uh for the New, New Yorker reported that a study of infant deaths in Southeast London, published in the Journal of um, Maternal, Fetal, and Neonatal Medicine, found that about Half of unexpected infant collapses remain unexplained after an autopsy. So, like, there's shit backing it up, but at the same point in time, 
if your death rate is going up, there's normally a reason and you should be looking at all different reasons and not just being like, no, that's not the reason. It's all because of this. Which they didn't do. They didn't do any of that shit. They're just like, yeah, it could be a virus. It could be this. It could be that. It could be um, an organic reason. Like, literally, the reason was right there. So, yeah. On July 3rd of 2018, police arrested Lucy on suspicion of eight counts of unaliving and six counts of attempted unaliving. After Lacey's arrest, Lucy's arrest, not Lacey, I don't know police began investigating her entire career, including the time at Liverpool Women's Hospital. Lucy was bailed on July 6, 2018, rearrested on June 10, 2019, and bailed again on June 13th. So whoever keeps bailing her ass out needs to fucking stop. Like, Throw away the fucking key. On November 10th of 2020, she was arrested once again and denied bail. Thank fucking God. Lucy denied all charges against her and pointed to issues of the hospital hygiene and staff levels. So she's saying, no, it's because of the staff. It's because of the hygiene. It's because this was dirty. That was dirty. Not because I did anything wrong. But if you know anything about neonatal units and where, like, if your child is born before 32 weeks or any time along that time, um, they literally have to keep that shit sterilized. I mean, 100% sterilized. So... <sighs> yeah, I just don't understand it. And whoever kept bailing Lucy out needed to be fucking hit in the head with a two by four. <laughs> uh Lucy's trial began on October tenth, two thousand twenty two before Mr. Justice Goss. She pled not guilty. Um Lucy's parents and families of all the victims attended the trial. That must have been hard. The child victims were referred as child A to child Q. So they really kept like the names out of that shit. So that way there wasn't anything that could be, you know. Because at that point in time, I mean, they're fucking babies. Why would you throw their name out into the press? The press security around the identities of the 17 babies and nine colleagues who gave evidence was rarely seen outside proceedings involving matters of national security so like basically they kept that shit under wrap two years before the criminal trial mr justice state banned the identifications of the living victims under their 18th birthday. So basically, that would be why. If they were under 18, they were not allowed to be named. Several adult witnesses requested anonymity, which is rarely granted unless testifying would endanger their lives, which, let's face it, if Miss Lucy could do this, what could her family do? So the judge ended up approving these requests, ruling that getting testimony from the colleagues was more important than them being publicly identified. So let's get into the evidence. What all evidence they had. So uh, the mother of one of the victims described her hearing infant screams and walking into finding him with blood around his mouth and 
Lucy in the room. She testified that Lucy had attributed the blood to a tubing issue, saying, trust me, I'm a nurse. The ba baby's condition soon worsened, and he died within a few hours later. So, yeah. Uh, Lucy later sent a sympathy card to the patient, to the parents on the day of the baby's funeral. Upon Lucy's arrest, it was found on her phone that she had a photographed the card before she sent it and had still kept pictures of it. It was also revealed during the trial that Lucy had to be told more than once not to enter a room where patient, uh, the parents of one of the victims were grieving. So basically she was going in to talk to the grieving mothers. Uh, Lucy told a colleague that taking child aid to the mortuary was the hardest thing she ever had to do. So, she, basically, she caused the baby's death, and then she's like, she's like, giving condolences to the grieving family, but at the same point in time, she's the one that caused the death. Um... The Crown Prosecutor Service cited texts sent from Lucy to friends describing them as a live blogging of events and as displaying intrusive curiosity. Three days after the death of Child A, Lucy had messaged the manager of the unit offering to do more shifts, saying, from a confidence point of view, I need to take an ITU baby soon. Two days later, she had a heated text exchange with a colleague over her manager refusing to let her go back onto the intensive care ward and remained on shift elsewhere in the hospital shortly after the exchange child C's conditions worsened and died the following day. After the third baby's death in a fortnight, 2015, Lucy replied to a text from a sympathetic colleague saying that she would keep plowing on and added, I think there is an uh, sympath uh, element of fate involved. There is a reason for everything. About two hours after the collapse of Child M, Lucy sent texts reading, Work was, has been shit, but I just won $135 on Grand National. Child M. Uh, what the fuck? Like, literally, a baby just died, and she's like, oh, I won $135 on a fucking horse. And unpacking party sounds good to me with my favorite baka. Ha ha ha. Yeah, let's talk about getting drunk. Lucy had also searched for the families of several infant victims on Facebook, including on the anniversary of the baby's death and on Christmas Day. The prosecutor said that she would search for a number of them within minutes after each other, as if haunting gr for hunting for grief. In total, Lucy had searched for 11 of the families affected. Lucy testified that this was out of general curiosity and said, I was always on my phone. She searched for the families of infants 31 times during the year of the deaths took place. She, she searched for other people 
2,287 times. So literally, she's constantly looking people up. Holy shit. Get off your fucking phone, goddamn. The prosecution in Lucy's case argued that suspicious incidents begin in 2015 when Lucy qualified to work with infants in intensive care and that in April of 2016, when the ward manager reassigned Lucy from night shifts to day shifts, their distribution shifted accordingly. So basically what they're saying is babies were dying at night when Lucy was working and then during the day when she got reassigned. Which is fucked up. Go fuck yourself, Lucy. Um, a consultant testified that in February 2016, he had walked in on Lucy standing over, uh, <sighs> disarturing infant and failing to intervene he said that lucy had responded to his questions by telling him that the infant had only just started declining the infant in question survived the collapse so basically he walked in on her just watching the baby fucking collapse and was like oh he he just started even though you don't know how long that co-worker was standing there before he said anything all the babies involved had been expected to live and so their deaths came out of the blue like they were told their babies would make it previously the majority of collapse cases in the premature babies in premature babies were either expected or if not still medically explained though this has been contested with a study funding that roughly half of such cases remain unexpected expected on average regardless during the investigation and the trial it was held that the deaths involving lucy were unusual in this regard between march and june of 2016 another three babies almost unalived while under Lucy's care. Towards the end of June, she was helping care for triplets. All three had been in a very good health, and the deaths of the two boys on consecutive days were causing staff considerable distress and shock, with the notable ex exception of Lucy. So she Lucy just didn't give a rat's ass that the baby died because she knew they were going to die because she fucking did it. But, like, what the fuck? In August of 2015, one infant referred as to Child E died, and within two hours, his twin, Child F, became severe, seriously unwell, but fully recovered later the same day. During the police investigation, a doctor helped police look over clinical records, noticed unusual blood test results for child F, and one other records. Oh, this uh, child F and one other infant child L. A third blood test results to similar characteristics was later discovered in the clinical records by the prosecution's lead expert witness. So basically whatever is in their whatever she gave them is in their blood and child F and L both had it and then one other child. So the first two of these tests results resulted in attempted murder charges and became central to the trial but lucy was never charged in relationship to the third the prosecution agreed that the test results demonstrated deliberate poisoning by insulin so she was given the baby oh my god 
they always say that if you want to get away with unaliving somebody, give them a shot of insulin. Why? Because they'll just consider it undiagnosed diabetes and call it a closed case. Just a heads up. So, she wasn't charged with that baby's attempted unaliving. I'm getting a headache reading this because, oh my god. I would be killing somebody. And yes, I'm reading it because literally I'm doing three different cases and I would lose my focus on all three of them. <sighs> the first two of these test results resulted in attempted murder charges. The prosecutors agree that the test results demonstrated deliberately poisoned by insulin. Two of the medical expert witness described the evidence as a smoking gun. At trial, Lucy herself accepted the prosecutor's claim that the test results showed that the two infants had been deliberately injected with insulin but denied that she had done it. So she agreed that they, it happened. She just denied it. Like, yeah, it happened, but I didn't do it. Since the trial, the interpretation of the blood test results had been dis disputed by experts. I don't know how it's supposed to be disputed. At the same time as child L's blood sugar collapsed, his twin brother, child M's unexpectedly collapsed as well under Lucy's care, but managed to survive after 30 minutes of make basically reviving them. The prosecution argued that Lucy had injected air into the bloodstream. The prosecution also noted that although by this point she was not supposed to work night shifts, Lucy was caring for child L as she specifically volunteered to do an extra shift to care for her. So she's not supposed to be working night shifts, but she's like, oh, I'll work another shift. I'll work another shift. I'll work another shift. Like, at what point in time do you burn out? Um, a pediatrician testified that he and other clinicals had previously raised concerns about Lucy, but were told by the hospital administration that they should not re really be saying such things and not to make a fuss. Fuck no, raise a fuss. Tell fucking everybody. I don't care. Fucking tell somebody, because at this point in time, this bitch is crazy. Another doctor testified that Lucy commented an hour before one of the victims dies, he's not leaving here alive, is he? Although the consultants made their desires to have Lucy removed from her duties known to the hospital staff after the triple incident, this was refused and the next day another baby almost unalived under Lucy's care. The prosecution presented the injury with a shift chart showing Lucy as the only nurse on duty for 25 incidents. Referring to the chart in his opening remarks, prosecutors Barrister Nick Johnson said, by a process of simple elimination, Lucy must be responsible for the incident since the trial, statisticians and others have questioned the use of this chart and the criteria by which incidents were admitted. Infant, infants requiring intensive care of those born before 32 weeks that unex the unexpected death stopped. So after 
she stopped working, they stopped. Lucy was accused of falsifying times on patient records so as not to be placed at the scene of the collapse. She denied doing so and suggested the changes were errors made by her or another nurse. Criminal psychologist David Holmes has argued that the varied methods she used to attack her victims, such as insulin or air injection or overfeeding milk, would have been specifically chosen as things that would dissipate and not be easily detectable afterwards. So, basically what they're saying in this court trial is that she used methods like air, insulin, or overfeeding that would not be noticeable to other people and could not be detected so she could get away with it. Like I said, if you ever want to unlove somebody, give them insulin. Because at the end of the day, guess what? It will. It's harder to document. So is there. Um, so, uh, the final verdicts were returned by the jury on August 18th of 2023. Lucy was found guilty of seven counts of unaliving the babies. Lucy was also found guilty of seven counts of attempted unaliving of six infants. Lucy was found not guilty on two counts of attempted unaliving. The jury was unable to re reach a verdict on six further attempted unaliving charges. Nicholas Johnson Casey asked the court for 28 days to consider whether a retrial would be sought for the six counts. On August 21st of 2023, Lucy was sentenced to life imprisonment with a whole life order, the most severe sentence possible under the English law. She is the fourth woman in UK history to receive such a sentence. A cruel, calculated, and cynical campaign of child unaliving involving the smallest and most vulnerable children. So basically saying preemies are the most vulnerable children and she chose them. <sighs> so... Why did she do this? There is no reason. There is like literally no motive of why she did this. They do say that she has Munchausen's by proxy, which would make sense because but the only thing that doesn't make sense is the fact that when people caught her doing this, she's like, oh, they only started collapsing. They didn't go into, like, any of... Uh, yeah, there was really no motive. There's no reason to take a baby's life. They're they're little angels. Um, so in January two thousand twenty four, which was this year, she appealed for permission. Uh, she applied to the court for appeal. Um, on her convictions, which the judge refused. 
Lucy renewed her application and at a three-day hearing in 2024, her lawyers put forward four grounds of appeal concerning the trial judge's refusal of application. But in May 2024, the three judges at the court appeal refused her permission for an appeal. As part of the appeal, Lucy's counsel, Ben Myers, again tried to question the inclusion of evidence um, by Dewey Evans, a doctor and the prosecutor's lead witness, saying it should have been disallowed as evidence as he had been dogmatic and biased. The appeal judge rejected these circumstances, ruling that it was incorrect to state that Evans lacked impartially at, and that he indeed was well qualified to give an opinion. The appeal judges were of the view that it was up to the jury to assess the quality of Evans' evidence. A second ground for appeal was that the medical evidence that Lucy had fatally injured, injected air into baby's bloodstreams was very weak. Well, the third ground was that the judge had been wrong to direct the jury that they could convict even if there were they were unsure of the precise method used by Lucy for every case. The final ground was that the judge had failed to investigate the impartial impartially of one of the jurors. All of these four grounds were refused by the court with the judge subsequently writing written, written statement concluding that the trial had been therefore fair, comprehensive, and correct, and that none of the four legal challenges advised by Lucy were arguable, saying that the criteria for the admission of fresh evidence has not been met. At a hearing of on September 2025, or September 25th, 2023, the CPS confirmed that there would be a retrial of one of the six counts of attempted on a libing against Lucy on which the jury at the original trial could not reach a verdict. This was not to start until after judges had decided whether or not to grant Lucy permission to appeal against her existing convictions. The retrial starts on june 10th 2024 so here shortly the pro er it's already started i will look that up the prosecutors asserted that the child child k repetitively deteriorated when left alone with lucy despite the previous nurse testifying that the baby's condition seemed stable when she left him the consultant on duty that night was Robbie Jameer, J. Ram, and he alleged that he had gone into the nursery to reassure himself that the baby would be would be okay in Lucy's care, only to suspiciously find Lucy standing next to child K's cot and not doing anything or calling for assistance. While the infant was in distress, it was established that the dis distraction had been assisted while the infant was distressing. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, uh, it had been caused by the child's breathing to becoming dislodged and this happened again twice in the next few hours which the prosecutions asserted occurred that when lucy was present present on june 2nd 
or July 2nd, Lucy was found guilty of attempted murder and on July 5th of 2024 was sentenced to a whole another whole life order. So basically, guess what? She got charged for that one. But <sighs> this woman literally took the lives of so many babies for no fucking re reason. Like, I don't understand how people can go in to become a nurse and then just be like, oh, yeah, no, we're just going to on, on a live, everybody. They have to be a little bit more than mental. They have to be plain out insane. Now, I hope you enjoyed all three of these cases. We love you, and we hope you have a great time. Love you all. Bye.